rates. And this has come up over, uh, over the course of the last six months as this has gone through the planning <coughs> department. And the specific point is if when the calculation is made, and I think we've heard it, but I think this is a key point that the public on both sides has been bringing up. And the second is if there is a council discretionary direction that says it's going to be 60-40 or 50-50 commercial versus a residential, what does that do to the count per the state law? So I, I think we need the force of law to, ex to explain what the pattern is <coughs> and what is required, again, by law. Um, I'm going to tackle that. Um, let's see, Attorney Rico and Janet will just jump in um, at any point. Um, state law says that when calculating a density bonus project, and this is a density bonus project, um, they have requested a bonus under state law. It says that you figure out the maximum number, and the whole concept of density bonus is the applicant gets a, a bonus above the maximum amount allowed by the current zoning on their property as it exists the day they walk in with their application. So when the developer says, I want a 20% density bonus, first question is, above what? State law spells it out. How do you figure that out? You figure out what the acreage of the land is that they own and what the zoning is. Um, in this case, the acreage, we went through that math, and it's zoned at 30 units the acre. That's how we got to the 491 units. Then they get their 20% their 20 density bonus on top of that, which is how we got to 589. Um, state law, then state density bonus law and the Housing Accountability Act says cities, and this is not just an Alameda thing, this is a California thing, cities, if a developer comes in and asks for that bonus, you can't use your regulatory, your zoning process. Now, this is not a Tidelands question. This is just a straight zoning master planning process to try to reduce that number. Um, and, um, but let's say, in our case, if it's MX, we will want more commercial. But how that would play out in a case like this with um, Ansonal Terminals is, I uh, would say in this case, 50,000 is not enough. We can say, I believe, we can say, you know what? This is MX. We have the ability to say we want more commercial. We want more commercial. What we cannot say is we want more commercial and less residential. Um, if our demands for more commercial require that the buildings get taller, then under state law, the developer has the right to say, your height limit is preventing me from building the units that I'm entitled to, the 589. Um, so we will then have two choices at that point. We can say, OK, well, <laughs> never mind. We don't care about all that commercial anymore so much. We'd rather keep the building short. Or we can say, you know what? We really wanted that extra commercial, so we're OK busting through the height limit. Um, this issue about the Tidelands Exchange, but no? I was just asking okay. about our, dis our discretion and our zoning that says that MX we can set by discretion what the percentage is. I think I heard you say that. But we cannot do that and at the same time reduce the number of units that are calculated based on the acreage owned by the applicant at the time they w submit the application. Is that correct, Mr. Attorney? That is correct. Any other questions or comments, I have, uh, Vice Mayor? Uh, I have a question for, actually, for Andrico. So we've heard a lot about the California Housing Accountability Act tonight. Can you just, uh, my, my understanding is that there have been two recent changes to it in 2016 and 2017. Can you speak to that? Um, actually, um, Madam Vice Mayor, if you don't mind, I'd let uh, Andrew <coughs> field that question. 
Okay. I, what I'm what I'm getting at is what is our legal exposure? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear from Andrew, but he he's the expert on the on the legal thing. Let me just tell you about mm -hmm. the changes this uh, um, accountability act. So this is a this is a law that's been on the books for a while, the it's Housing Accountability Act, and basically what it says is. You can't use your zoning requirements to, to try to reduce the number of units, with one exception. Um, if, if there is evidence on the record that there is a health or safety problem, so this is not a traffic problem, not a tall building problem, but your fire chief or your police chief comes to you and says, people will either get sick or die from this. So, and the only way to mitigate that is by reducing the number of units. If there's any other way of reducing that public safety problem, um, then you have to use that, that other mitigation. Um, what the new laws also did was make it very, very clear, if you do do this in violation of state law, and if you get sued, mm -hmm. Not only will you lose, but you will be picking up all of the attorney's fees for the people who are suing you. So it just they just put it right in the housing law. Like so, this is what's gonna happen. So I just I just want clarification. So there's mandatory attorney's fees if the petitioners win and the city loses. And the project gets approved, of course. Okay. And then is there also a fine associated with it? My understanding was that in 2017, the 2017 SB 167 also allows judges to have the power to fine cities. I'm, Is that applicable? I, I, well, the, law go, the new changes go into effect, my understanding, is in 2018, January. I'm not positive on that last point. Um, that's certainly consistent with the intent of the law and, and the changes, but I'm It was signed into law in September, end of September. I'm, I'm just curious. Our, our housing <laughs> expert attorney, Selena Chen, it doesn't happen to be here, so we're struggling a little bit on the, on the impacts of that. We can get back to you at a future time if you would like. Well, I, I know the answer, but I'm just okay. curious if, we're, if we have done an analysis of what the potential impact could be. Has she, has she looked at this, I guess, is my other question? Has she done an analysis? <laughs> Uh, I believe she has, but uh, she's not here at the moment, so um, I don't know, and I personally have not, so I would have to get back to you. Okay. Mm. Sorry, can I follow up on that? So I think I got from the gist of your comments that, say, for example, hypothetically, the swap does not go through, the developer can come back and basically by right can build 500, um, 489 units. 589. 589, sorry, 589. So Correct. there's really nothing we can do about it, and if there's a problem that's not health related. We could be subject to damages. That's right. And so, so on. the way. Okay. So, and whether we up that 50,000 square foot commercial to 100,000 or 200,000 or whatever, there's still going to be 589. And even if it's quote unquote too high for what most people in Alameda want, too bad. Yeah, that's, I mean, exactly. Okay. And the, the only reason I'm harping on this is, I mean, I've. Obviously, everybody's concerned about the number of housing units and the traffic implications. And so it's like, stop the, stop the exchange, stop the exchange, in the hope that it stops the housing units. And what okay. we just are trying to communicate to everyone here behind me is, don't think that turning down the exchange means that you don't get 589 units. The, pro the property owner will have only one choice, and that is to go back. It will certainly slow things down. We'll have to go back to the planning board, Revised. We'll have a discussion about heights again. We'll have a discussion about the amount of commercial. But I can pretty much guarantee you that project's going to have 589. And your ability to say it's too many housing units, you will not have that ability. What you will not have is that list of additional benefits that we negotiated as part of the exchange. So okay. it'll just be a stripped down, um, less beneficial project for the community. And our legal staff agrees with that. And basically, yes, that is correct. I mean, you're trained attorneys in land use law, and we hire you and depend on you to give us that advice and interpret the law. So, I mean, I would say that, you know, I would trust your judgment on this than a layperson. So, but then my follow up question is then 
are we forced to do the swap based on those rules? I mean, I think I know the answer. The but answer is no. Okay, because we have a proprietary interest in yeah. that. Okay. This, exactly. 